I've had this dream for a while to bring a group, sometimes I call you the founding mothers together. So this year, I went for it, and I got nothing. <laughs> I got crickets, so I waited. And one by one, they said, if we can do it together, we'll be there. <laughs> so here they are. Introducing the Fab Four. <laughs> For these four women, football isn't just a game. It's a way of life. Oh, oh we're just missing you. Oh, my God. I'm glad you're here. I was How to... are you, Martha? Great. Welcome to our little club. I have been told that I have watched more professional football than anyone alive. This year, we have it right here in <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> From the time I was born, I have loved the game. And after almost 100 years, I still do. Congratulations, Chicago. I went to my first football game when I was six. I took over the Detroit Lions when I was 88. Oh, nerve <laughs> And to this day, I have only one thing in mind, make the Lions fans proud. And, and you said mm -hmm. that we're gonna get off to a fast start. Boy, did you do what you said well, you do. <laughs> in Pittsburgh, we love our Steelers. It seems the team is part of us from the day we were born. We live further down the street, and we live in great proximity to our stadium. Right down the hill. Right down that hill. When I married Dan Rooney, I joined a love affair shared by a family, a team, and a city. Anxious to get that season going, I bet you are too. More than, you know yeah. how it is, it's yeah. the journey, it's time yeah. to go now. I was born in Texas, which automatically makes me a football fan. <laughs> Andy, go get him, good yeah, luck. I can't even begin to guess as to how many games I've been to. Pee Wee, high school, college, and the pros. <laughs> But when it comes to the Super Bowls, I know the exact number, every one of them. They come from four different corners of America, but their paths have led them to the same place. For the better part of a century, football has been their life, their livelihood, and their passion. It has broken their hearts, brought them countless thrills, and rewarded them with a lifetime of Sundays. So why don't we start at the beginning, and I'm gonna start right here, Mrs. McCaskey. Could you take us back and paint a picture for us? What was professional football like in the 1920s? Well, there are a few things that have happened in the National Football League before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Only a few. <laughs> My dad, George Hallis, attended the meeting in Canton, Ohio, to form an association of all these minor league football teams. The franchise price was determined to be $100 a franchise. <laughs> Sorry about that, new owners. <laughs> At 5.30, I'm out the door with my driver and we go to 615 Mass, and it's the best way to start my day, get God involved in what I hope to be doing that day, and uh, ask for his help. At 96 years old, faith and football are still at the center of Virginia McCaskey's life. Can we just call her the first lady of football? Yeah, That'd be all right. can do that. You know, she spoke to the team the other day and gave a little history lesson on the Chicago Bears. I would have liked to have been in that room. There's nobody in this room more fired up for this game than our owner, Mrs. McCaskey. Okay? So, so she doesn't speak often in front of the team, but when she does, it's powerful. And she's uh, she's got a, she's got a voice, and when she's in the room, you're you're gonna listen. The Bears have been my life all these years. I feel very blessed and grateful. 
I don't want them to to um, look on me as some little old lady who was just kind of hanging around. I want them to know how much I care about the bears and, and them. I just like to hear stories of people that have lived life. And she has lived life. This would be a great opportunity for us to learn about this rich history of this team. All right. Mitchell Trubisky, quarterback, and uh, my question <laughs> is, uh, what are some of your favorite memories of your father as a coach? Our box at Wrigley Field was the one closest to the team bench, but he was never on the bench. Mostly it was watching him go up and down the sidelines, keep everybody moving. Hold the ball, hold the ball, hold the ball. I think the mccaskey Hallis link to the Bears is unique in American sports. I, I, don't, I don't think there's another case of a team in any sport that has been owned by the same family since really the beginning of the industry. The NFL started because George Hallis named it. The Bears originated in Decatur, Illinois. In 1920, George Hallis ran a company football team and helped start a pro football association. The very next year, Hallis's Decatur Staley's moved to Chicago, where they later became the Bears. The country was in a recession, and my dad was going to do everything he could to make it a success. If Hallis was going to make a go of it, running a pro football team in a struggling league, he had to find a way to drum up interest. He found his answer in Red Grange, the greatest football player of his era. He was the Babe Ruth of college football. For the Bears and the NFL to sign him was a real coup. In 1925, Grange went on a barnstorming tour to promote the Bears and the game of football. And Virginia Hallis McCaskey was on the tour. She was only three years old. When Red Grange would get off the train, there were so many people waiting to see him. They decided I could be his camouflage, and if he wore a hat and carried me off the train, then people wouldn't recognize him. <laughs> That got him through the crowd. Boys in the playground when she was in third or fourth grade were talking about baseball. She said, I don't want to talk about baseball. I want to talk about football. What do you know about football? Why well, know Red Grange? Oh, no, you don't. You don't know him. <laughs> so I came home that night and told my dad, and he got an autographed picture from Red that, yes, he knew me, and he thought I was swell. Did you learn about the game of football from your dad? Did he teach you? Was it more osmosis because you were at so many games? I learned from my mother. Really? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that go? Well, just listening to her during the game and then asking her questions on the way home. I knew better than to ask her questions during the game. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually, as an aside, the first time I got to see Mrs. McCaskey at a game was um, after Roger started his job a few years ago. And as we walked in, he grabbed my arm and he said, don't speak to her during the game. <laughs> <laughs> Which was excellent advice, by the way. I went to a Bears game, and she is an adamant fan of the game. There was no talking. I said something to George McCaskey, and he's like, shh, shh, mom's, mom's watching the game. We got to wait. You got to wait till, uh, wait, wait till there's talent on the field. Wait till a commercial. She's not, you know. So we're sitting there, and it's, you know, 10, 12, play drive, whatever. And then finally, there's a talent on the field. They do commercials, and then I go down. How you doing, Ms. McCaskey? Oh, hey, Charles. How you know, we, we talk for 30 seconds, and then commercial break is over. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah, let me, mm, let me watch this game. Virginia watched as her father both played for and coached the Bears. At 16, her life took a new direction when she left home to attend Drexel University in Philadelphia. She meets Ed McCaskey, somewhat accomplished singer, president of his class at Penn, and uh, romance ensues. George Hellis sends a couple of his cronies, Bert Bell, who was the owner of the Eagles and later became commissioner, and Art Rooney, who was the owner of the Steelers. My 
grandfather sent them to the Penn campus to investigate my father. One day in a coffee shop, the man who owned the coffee shop said to my father, there's some guys over there who want to talk to you. And it was Bert Bell and Art Rooney. I often wonder what on earth was going through Dad's mind. You know, he, he didn't know these guys. And, you know, why are they here? Why are they talking like this? Ed McCaskey planned to ask Virginia for her hand in marriage after the 1942 championship game between the Bears and the Redskins. Dad tells a story that we're losing, and he looks over at Mom, and she's crying. And he says to her, why are you crying? It's only a football game. And she said, don't you understand? If we lose, he's never going to let us get married. I had learned early on in my childhood, if I really wanted something, I would wait until after the Bears had won a game. And here we were losing the championship. And I thought, oh, this isn't going to work. <laughs> it was mom who finally said, listen, he's not going to let us get married. We need to take matters into our own hands. We did elope, but we were married by a Catholic priest. And there were just the two of us there. At one point, I said to dad, when did George Hallis start liking you? And his quick answer was, maybe next week. <laughs> The McCaskies moved to the Chicago suburb of Des Plaines and began building a family. They had a football huddle, 11 children. They all lived in a very modest house, and they shared uh, bedrooms, and it was not the kind of uh, privileged upbringing that you might, uh, might expect of the family of an NFL owner. I vividly remember you know, being a, a young kid and seeing her on a, an extension ladder up on the second floor, painting the gutters you know, Rust-Oleum Brown. I don't see any other moms in the neighborhood doing that. The one job Virginia never expected to take on was running the Bears. But when her brother Muggs, who had been president of the team, died unexpectedly in 1979, her father George set a plan for the Bears' future once he was no longer around. I always knew my younger brother would be the one to take over. So I had the best of all worlds. I had all the perks of being associated with the Chicago Bears and none of the responsibility. That changed when Muggs died. Well, Dad finally got around to his estate planning. There was a small paragraph that in matters relating to football operations, Virginia would have the final word. And to me, that was his vote of confidence. George House passes away on October 31st, 1983, and now Mom is thrust into this role that um, she never wanted. Well, the alternative would have been to sell, as several people advised me, and I couldn't imagine doing that. What would I do with money? And selling a legacy, an inheritance, it just didn't seem the right thing to do after all that my dad and mother had put into it their whole lives. I loved my dad, and his life was football, and so it became my life. Well, here we go. Lions 0-2, looking for their first win. Patriots 1-1, one one, coming off a disappointing loss. And they don't react to losses too well if you're the opposition. How you doing? Good luck tonight. Good. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. I know we'll win. We will do our best. Thank a you. A new much. chapter began for Martha Firestone Ford just a few years ago as she was about to turn 90. I'm glad to be here and able to give you a statement about leadership changes our family has made today at the Lions. My mother made quite a leap from never being allowed to participate in sports to being the principal owner of a National Football League team. Well, I had very little sports in my life. I think the only thing that I can remember with clarity is that my father took me to a football game. I was about five or six years old. As fate would have it, it was the Portsmouth Spartans. And they later on became the Detroit Lions. 
Martha Firestone Ford is the granddaughter of tire magnate Harvey Firestone. So, it wasn't a complete coincidence that Martha's mother was friendly with another prominent American industrial family, the Fords of the Ford Motor Company, whose son Bill happened to be unattached. My mother and Bill's mother were good friends. I'd never met Bill, but I think that they decided it was time I did, so we did go to lunch and we did have a good time. The two kept in touch, and a couple years later, the time seemed right. A wedding in Akron, Ohio, unites two pioneer automotive families, Ford and Firestone. A crowd of neighbors is on hand to admire the bride, Miss Martha Firestone, and her breathtaking wedding gown of rare antique rose point and duchess lace over silk. Good luck to the happy couple. It didn't take long for Martha to recognize she would be sharing her husband with his other true love, the Detroit Lions. I don't think football was really for women that much. She knew my father was passionate about it, so she figured if they were gonna have things to talk about, she'd better learn football, and so she did. I brought my portable radio. I could watch the game and also listen to what Van Patrick had to say, so it all came together pretty well. Oh, hello, everybody. Come on in and join us. This is Van Patrick. And I'm here in the studio, ready to record the commentary on this year's highlights from the Detroit Lions football games. As a Lions board member, Bill witnessed three championships in the 1950s. But then, the team's fortunes went downhill. We went to a lot of games, but Bill became very frustrated about how the games were going. First and 10 on the Detroit 10. Here's Morrow trying to pass it. Atkins gets him for a safety. There's the signal. Finally, his brother Henry said to him, stop complaining about the football. If you care that much, why don't you buy the team? He said, what would you think if I bought the Lions for $4 million? And I said, oh, that's way too much. George Hallis got his team for $100. <laughs> we have to pay $4 million. As it turned out, we paid six and a half million. <laughs> Was there a point in time, though, you remember, and maybe it was with your kids, that it did just become part of your soul? It just became a wonderful way of life because we went to the games, took all the children. Their only plan was that, that nobody could ask questions, so. <laughs> they got the memo? So, but they still wanted to come, believe it or not. <laughs> That's funny. Everyone was learning the game from Martha on down. I've been going to games since I was five or six years old. It was expected that we would be able to sit there and pay attention and not bother anybody. And we weren't even allowed to go to the restroom unless it was the end of the quarter or halftime. We talked an awful lot about it during the week. It was always a family conversation. One of Bill's favorite pictures that he had on his bureau was a picture of our youngest daughter, Elizabeth. Instead of reading Cinderella, she was reading the Lion's Facts book. The whole family sort of was involved. For over 80 years, one thing synonymous with Lions football is the annual Thanksgiving Day game. In the 1960s is when I started going to the Thanksgiving games, and I've been to every one since then. We welcome you to Detroit for the Lions hosting of the Chicago Bears. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Hi, Lil. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks, Mom. How are you? Happy Thanksgiving. Detroit and Thanksgiving just go together. You're right, they exactly. Really yeah. Well, th uh, this has been going on for since, what, 1934. Yeah. But perhaps the best part of the day is catching up with family and old friends, even if those friends may be foes for a few hours. I think the McCaskies in the house, have you been seeing them since the 60s? Yes, they've come by every time we play them, and Mrs. McCaskey always brings us a box of chocolates. <laughs> a big box of chocolates. Yeah, we, we've been pals for so many years. I think she's one of the most wonderful people I've ever met. Hello. Here we are again. Oh, Martha. <laughs> I wish you well today, but not too well. <laughs> I know. Just well, as you said before last week, it's so so hard to play in friends. <laughs> but you want so much to win. Right, exactly. Do you know what I call 
paint to your friends. Right, exactly. Getting set for the Thanksgiving Day game in the city of Detroit, a tradition that dates back to 1934. Well, it's the way we celebrate Thanksgiving, and we love the fact that we can share Thanksgiving in this way with the rest of the nation. Every time we win, it makes Thanksgiving very special. It certainly makes the turkey taste better. You know this very well also. Yeah, this is a great park. And I could take the children in a stroller from that um, apartment and walk straight up to my mother's. And this is where you played as a child also. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're not ostentatious people. They could live anywhere, but uh, they have chosen to live uh, in the place they loved more than any other. Well, here's the fountain I was telling you about. It was my latest project. I'm sort of now known as the fountain lady. And it, uh, will it change life, really, for a lot of people in the neighborhood? I hope it does. That's my hope, yeah. There are a lot of people who will just write a check or show up at the gala, but Pat really gets down into the nitty gritty of bringing back this park that everybody on the Lower North Side loves. When I moved here, you know, doing my due diligence, looking at a lot of awesome suburban communities, but I asked the Roonies, where do they live? They lived in the city. So I live a few blocks from Art II in the city. Patricia Regan grew up on the edge of Allegheny West Park in Pittsburgh's North Side. She still lives in the neighborhood, in the same house that her late husband Dan Rooney grew up in. A devout Catholic daughter of Irish immigrants, Patricia is a North Sider to her core. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Oh, this is Are you real busy? Go Steelers. How are you guys yeah, doing? Not, actually. I worked in a local drugstore, which is where I met a lot of the Rooney children. Dan and his eight siblings lived on the other side of the park. His family had established itself in Pittsburgh when his father, Art, founded the Steelers in 1933. You know, my grandfather, Art Rooney, he was sort of the quintessential North Sider. He, he was known to be very, very generous, very caring for everyone on the community. So you came here as a child oh, as well? Oh, yeah. This is our parish, yeah. And this. Isn't this nice? Yeah. The North Side for nearly 80 years, see? So you see your father-in-law every time you walk into church? I know, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Pat and Dan met in grade school and dated in high school when Pat finally got up the nerve to ask Dan to her prom. I thought I would ask him, never knowing what kind of an answer I would get. And uh, he said, well, I don't know how to dance. And I said, well, I'm not that good either. <laughs> and so we talked for a while and he said, um, all right, I'll do it. A few years later, the prom date turned into a wedding date. Mrs. Rooney, you didn't even know the intense role that football would play in your life at that point. I thought you went to the game on Sunday, and that was the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought you just went to a 9 to 5 desk job, <laughs> which sort of didn't turn out to be the way things were. One time, I just locked up because he didn't come home. And uh, he was outside throwing pebbles up at the window. <laughs> Life in the Rooney household was hectic. The family grew to nine kids. The day my youngest sister was born, um, my father dropped my mother off at the hospital. He took her to the hospital, dropped her off, and went to the office and fired our coach. <laughs> Next thing you know, I had a baby girl and no husband. <laughs> he didn't think that that was unusual. I mean, it was kind of just another day in the life. Yeah, my mother didn't allow for anybody to feel like they were uh, any different than any other kids we went to school with. When my wife and I got hired, we had a press conference that day, and we were going to have dinner with Mr. and Mrs. Rooney. We walk out into a valet area, and uh, Mr. Rooney had kind of pulled his mid-sized Buick up on the side, a two-door, and uh, there was no driver, it was no limo or nothing. And just first having met them, I don't know what I expected. And Mrs. Rooney lifted up the passenger seat. She hit my wife on the shoulder. Come on, the girls are getting in the back. We'll let the boys sit up front and talk. And that's what they did, man. They got in the back and Mr. Rooney and I got up front, man, and off we went to dinner. 
Pittsburgh's greatest era was the 70s. Until then, the Steelers hadn't won a single playoff game. When I was little, the Steelers were really bad. We had a station wagon that used to be painted on the back, very large letters that said, this is the official Buick of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And we hated driving in it because people would boo at us. They would yell at us to get out of town. And then, of course, the 70s came and um, things turned around. Chuck Knoll came in and brought some kind of magic with him. We had a play here called Immaculate Reception. It was a big game, and it looked like we were really going to lose it. And now it is all wrapped up in this one. It is fourth down, still 10 to go. Pittsburgh's ball at their own 40-yard line, 22 seconds left to play. We were really sad and mad and, you know, thought we had lost, and we're all in this cement box where we sat for the games. And uh, my son is like five or six and he just turned his head away from them. Bradshaw running out of the pocket, looking for somebody to throw to, fires it downfield. And there's a collision. And it's caught out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Frank O'Hare. And then all of a sudden, it was like fireworks. And I said, Dan, Dan, Franco has the ball. It's almost like I was in shock or something because we were so used to us losing. The immaculate reception was, it was immaculate. It was just unbelievable. And galloping off into the sunset. That was a really happy start to a lot of good times. It was like the whole city became the team. Everybody won the game together. After all these years, when you come to this environment, see what's going on tailgating, tell me like the atmosphere, what it, what it does to your I never fail when I see our tailgaters to, you know, comment on how great our fans are. So what are you guys cooking up today? Oh, oh my God. Oh, wow. Wow. Great. That's all too good. They are the best. And the tailgating is incomparable. I would be honored if you would sign it. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. When I moved here to Kansas Stadium. City and we got the tailgate, I told my wife every time, we were so spoiled, we don't even know it. Everybody is having so much fun. It's a, a community experience, so people from this community. <laughs> so good to see you. So good to see you, well, you know? thank you. I tell you what, you still are fit enough to play. I would love to play, but you know, I can't get nobody to negotiate my contract. <laughs> At 81, Ultimate football fan Norma Hunt may live in Dallas, but when the Chiefs play at Arrowhead, she has another home. We had an apartment in the stadium, and we would spend the night in the stadium. I feel like Eloise at the plaza when I'm sleeping in the stadium. <laughs> it is such an incredible treat uh, to get to stay in such a beautiful place. The stadium. Many nights uh, before the game or the morning, the day of the game, I'd go down the field and kick field goals with my dad. They grew up loving sports, so about as soon as they could walk and talk, they were all ready to come. They really enjoyed staying in the stadium. Yes, oh, so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it is fun to hear the stadium come to life when you're in it and to try to get ready before the guests come. Look at the jacket, woo! <laughs> She's incredibly gracious. Your uniform, I couldn't help but admire it earlier. I just could barely take my eyes off it. You have to earn all of that, and I can't imagine how hard that was. My mom has a hand in making people feel special. And all the while, she's out running her own successful businesses. My mom is an avid investor. She built a wine business and now produces a terrific wine. And most importantly, though, is she made us all feel loved. <laughs> she is the, the best hostess. Uh, so I think that's just innately who she is. Hostessing, in fact, was how sport-loving Norma met Lamar Hunt while she was a teacher in Texas. 
During the summers, she went to work for the Dallas Texans as what they called a hostess. And that was a group of school teachers that my dad uh, put together. And the primary job that the Texans hostesses had was getting out and selling season tickets. The Texans were one of eight teams in the American Football League. Their owner, Lamar Hunt, and a group of businessmen had founded the league in 1959 after their attempts to buy NFL teams had been rejected. They call themselves the Foolish Club. In other words, we have to be very foolish to think we can take on the amazing, entrenched uh, National Football League. Norma's mission, getting local businesses to buy season tickets, was put to the test by the other new team in town. The National Football League did not like the competition. Having said for years that they would never expand to Dallas, they immediately expanded to Dallas. We wound up with both teams in Dallas, the Texans and the Cowboys, attracting just almost exactly the same number. About 10,000 fans didn't even get you to break even. It was very much a struggle for the American Football League to go up against the National Football League. I would try to talk to anybody and ascertain what their interest in football was, period. Frankly, as you see, I love to talk, so I practically talk their ear off. They would surrender and buy tickets because just to get me out of the office, I'm pretty sure. You know, it was, it was difficult to make a success of it. Lamar, ever the promoter, however, figured a way to get bodies in seats. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the huddle club, and every child could get in free if they would just bring their parent. <laughs> the parent had to pay. <laughs> And then we honored different groups of professionals, and one of them was Barber Day. So every barber in Dallas got to come to the game free <laughs> if he'd just bring somebody who'd pay with him. But in that process, I became Mrs. Lamar Hunt, and I think Lamar really liked how many season tickets I sold. I'm pretty sure that was it. <laughs> and watch it. The big rush is on, the kick is up, the kick is good, Dallas is the champion. Despite winning the AFL championship in 1962, the following year, Lamar moved the Texans to Kansas City, where his AFL team would no longer face competition from the NFL. The mayor of Kansas City called Lamar and said, we want your team. He saw what was happening. Even with all the challenges it faced, Lamar's new league remained progressive and innovative. When the AFL opened for business, the league heavily recruited players from black colleges. He grew up going to games when others looked around and saw this little white kid at this high school football game with all these black kids there and probably wondered, who is he? Lamar was smart enough to send our scouts to the black colleges. These colleges had dozens of fabulous athletes that had not really been tapped as much as they might have been. The Hunts and the other seven men who agreed to create that thing called the American Football League, if they had not done that, so many of us from historically black colleges especially, we wouldn't have had jobs. I'm the first African American middle linebacker to play full time in the history of the National Football League. I couldn't have imagined having played anywhere but there. The trials and tribulations that Hunt and the AFL face finally paid off in 1966 when the two leagues agreed to merge. Who does this panel think won the war? Who won the war? I think it's beneficial to both. When you look at all aspects of this with the championship game, I think it'll be one of the biggest sporting events of the year every year in America. One of the details that had to be worked out was the creation of a new championship game between the best AFL team and the best NFL team. Super small ball with more bounce per zectron ounce than any other ball. I had bought some gifts for the children. I saw this box full of Super Balls, and I thought, my gosh, our kids have got to have that. <laughs> my dad was in a meeting with a group of owners, and they were discussing the new championship game. And one of the owners, he asked my dad, what, what game are you talking about? My dad said, the last game, the final game, you know, the Super Bowl. He just threw it out there. And all Lamar could figure out was the name derived from the toy 
the Super Bowl. I'm gonna have football line up here. I gotta take it down, fella. Okay. It was a dream realized for Lamar and Norma Hunt, whose Kansas City Chiefs reached that very first title game. They lost to the Packers, but three years later, we're back in it, this time against the heavily favored Minnesota Vikings. So on the morning of Super Bowl IV, another couple got on the elevator with them, and it turned out it was Max Winter and his wife. Max was the owner of the Minnesota Vikings. Max had made a commitment to my dad in 1959 to be part of the American Football League, and the NFL convinced him to switch and take an NFL franchise. My dad never forgot about that slight. We try to make small talk and we say goodbye and then Lamar and I get off and he turned around to me and he said to me, we're going to win. They're more scared than we are. We're at the Super Bowl, the Lane Stadium in New Orleans. Let's go, boys. Hey, let's go, man. Hank Stram loved being mic'd, and he, he had his own language. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. Matriculate the ball down the field. He called a play, 65 toss power trap. 65 toss power trap. That might pop wide open, Rats. Running play coming to Garrett on a trap. Touchdown, Garrett scores. 65 toss power trap. I tell you that, maybe the there. Yes, sir, boys. <laughs> The play became so famous that when we redid the stadium, we incorporated it into the stones that surround the statue of Lamar. It's legendary in Chiefs history. Everyone understood how tough it was to do what they had just done. It makes everything that much more exciting and fun. Pretty fantastic. It's a beautiful trophy, and it really is a satisfying conclusion to the 10 years of the American Football League. A couple hundred thousand people showed up for that parade, and it was the best party ever. <laughs> Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the grace and the peace, the love of our Lord Jesus, be with you all. And with your spirit. So she goes to Jesus Mass every day. Her faith spirit. is critical to her being. And peace be with you. God bless you. What does it provide for you on a daily basis? A reason for living, really. With the Lord there is mercy. In him is plentiful redemption. Well, I'm wondering why I'm still here <laughs> and uh, asking for guidance. Are your prayers a little different on game day? I try to pray thy will be done, <laughs> but just in case you <laughs> are looking for a team to help, we're available. <laughs> Through the years, Virginia McCaskey's relationship with the Bears was nothing if not personal. As an adult, she developed a close bond with several players, none more so than Brian Piccolo, whose story was made into the film, Brian's Song. Hey, upstairs. Yeah. Hey, Brian Piccolo. <laughs> we had a uh, sense of humor that was a little strange at times, <laughs> but later I think, yeah, that was funny. <laughs> He had this horrible cough, and it was in the middle of the season, and he kept going to the doctor. And then they did the, all these different tests and discovered the tumor. Virginia's faith was put to the test when the player that she loved like a son was diagnosed with cancer. That was my problem, trying to handle his illness, because I was saying to God, the world needs people like Brian. Why is this happening? You think that football players can handle anything, recover from anything, and it uh, just didn't happen. He only lived six months 
from the point of being diagnosed. It was so fast, so fast. After he died, Virginia was just there for us and very supportive. Well, I would call Virginia, and she would just say not to worry. It's going to be taken care of. And we never saw a hospital bill. The funeral was paid for. She's like your mother, very caring, and she can feel what you're going through. Didn't talk so much about it, just kind of lived with through it. And I remember the uh, team was invited to a private showing of Brian's song. And when the credits were rolling, they still kept the lights off in the theater, just out of consideration for everybody. You know, it's been 40 years, and he still has a dramatic impact on us. After Brian died, my parents didn't want to get too close to any other players because it was so painful when Brian died. Uh, but then, five years later, uh, Walter Payton came along. As much as Virginia promised herself she wouldn't fall in love with another player after Brian Piccolo's death, Walter Payton won her over with his extraordinary talent and his outsized personality. Walter. <laughs> and whether you liked it or not, he was going to be part of your life. And you were going to enjoy it. And we did. Mr. Payton, this is Air Force One. Stand by for the president, please. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Very congratulations. Congratulations Well, thank you. And give my best to Nancy. <laughs> 13 years of incredible dedication. You can watch him on the field, those incredible runs, and then to know him off the field and to love him and appreciate him. Peyton retired in 1987 with the NFL record for career rushing yards. But just 12 years later, he announced that he had been diagnosed with a rare liver disease. To the people that really care about me, Just continue to pray. After he had passed, the McCaskey family, to just have them kind of take us under their wings and be there, it just speaks volumes. They really looked at him beyond being just a football player. When Walter passed away, the family had asked that my mom represent the Bears at the press conference. Which was a surprise, really because I hadn't done anything like that before. I said, can I get you a pad of paper? Can I get you a pen? Do you want to write some notes? And she just quietly said, no, I've got this. Walter Payton came into our lives. And you all know what a difference he's made for all of us for the Chicago Bears, for the National Football League. You could hear a pin drop. You know, she spoke from her heart and just owned the room. And for all of us, thank you. That same year, Virginia struggled with a heartache of a very different kind when she restructured the organization and replaced her son Michael as team president. I've had to make some tough calls and hope they were the right ones, done the right way. She knew what had to be done. She put the bears ahead of her family in that regard. One of her challenges now is to keep that big family interested and involved in perpetuating this legacy. I 
can walk into Hallis Hall and look at our Hall of Famers and say, I knew all those men. The first championship game is 1932. She was at the championship game. She was only nine years old. She was at the 73 to nothing championship game. She was at the championship games in the 60s. There's not any part of the history that, that she hasn't lived. Congratulations to the Bears. They're the NFC champs. That fur coat was the same fur coat that her mother wore in 1963 after the championship. That gives you an idea of how important tradition and this legacy is to her. In safeguarding the Bears' legacy, Virginia, some say, calls the shots privately. At 96, she attends every game, home and away, all while carefully watching over her father's team. Her purpose in life is to keep her father's legacy. All the opportunities I've had, all the privileges I've had, all the miracles I've watched, I'm just very grateful for my life. Flags at Ford Motor Company locations across the U.S. will fly at half staff for 30 days as a sign of respect. We're told funeral services for this icon in NFL history, automotive history, and U.S. history will be held privately. After Bill Ford passed away, there were reports that the team would be sold. But Martha Ford had other plans. Roger Goodell said to me, there's only one major owner and I said, but there are five of us, four children and myself. And he said, yes, but the buck stops with the major owner. And, and I said, all right, <laughs> I guess that's it. <laughs> you know, she wanted her children involved, but she was the controlling owner. And, you know, final decisions were going to be made by Mrs. Ford. I had very mixed emotions because I knew I was missing the key person in my life. So I had a certain feeling of responsibility and wanting to do a good job. In 2014, 88-year-old Martha Ford became the owner and chairman of the Detroit Lions. Her first regular season game in her new role was intended as a tribute to her late husband. Stafford with time, looks, rolls to his right now, slips one tackler, looks and looks. Throws down, field got a man wide open, Calvin at the 30, nobody between him and the end zone, but air to the end zone, Calvin, touchdown, Detroit Lions. It was a little bit bittersweet. Of course, I missed him, and yet I was proud of the way he's been honored at that night. We want to present a game ball in the Williams Clay Ford Seniors Honor, but we want to thank you also for all that you've done for us in terms of support you give us, and uh, hopefully this will be one of many. So thank you. Yeah. I thought it really belonged to Bill, but he wasn't here, so I kind of got a little bit emotional about it. But it was the beginning of my time with the Lions. Martha's titles aren't just words on a piece of paper. The biggest team decision since taking over came directly from her. I thought that we needed a new staff, and that did kind of worry me, but I was so sure it was the right thing that it wasn't difficult to do. Halfway through the 2015 season, things just weren't going well. We were one and seven. And I think it just was obvious to her that there had to be a change. Earlier today, we informed Tom Lewan and Martin Mayhew that they have been relieved of their responsibilities with the team. She informed both the president and the general manager that they were no longer with the organization. And I think that was what really sent the signal that you know, Martha Ford's in charge of the Detroit Lions. Our fans deserve a winning football team, and we will do everything possible to make it a reality. She sent a letter to all the ticket holders, just explaining what she'd done and why. I explained that they were very important to us and they deserve better. Afterwards, I picked up the phone and called Roger Goodell and said, what am I going to do? <laughs> Roger said, well, we have several consultants that work for the league, and you choose one to help you. 
Ernie, of course, he was the one that we chose. I told him that I was tired of being mediocre, and I really wanted a team that would win. When she took over, she was in control. She wasn't going to be a custodian. There was no question that she was running this operation, that she was running this search, and she was very, very active in it. I got Ernie at Corsi to take us to the Patriots. Bob Quinn was very good. Bob Quinn was the pro personnel director, and Bill Belichick was terrific for us. He said, look, since you're in New York, you can drive to Foxborough, and I'll give you a day to interview Bob Quinn. So I called Mrs. Ford. I said, look, I got a very short window. I'll interview him, and then I'll come back and give you the first report. She said, I'll be there. She asked as many questions as I did, good questions. She was prepared. I knew right away, I said, this is, this is going to be great, because uh, I'm not going to have to do this alone. She's very sharp. She's so passionate about her team, uh, about the city of Detroit, about the Lions fans. And, um, and I have a great deal of respect for that. She works very hard to uh, try to put her team in the best possible position to win and be competitive. Two years after hiring Bob Quinn, the Lions hired Patriots defensive coordinator Matt Patricia to become their head coach. For Martha and her board, running an NFL franchise isn't limited to just game days. We have meetings two or three times a week during the season. We're at training camp together so we can talk about players that we see. It's just such a big part of her life. I don't know where it begins or ends. I just want to say first bath. That was quite a game. That was, this will be a happy yeah. meeting. <laughs> I'm so impressed by the way that she handles things, runs the team, is involved. She was out of practice uh, last week. It was 90 some degrees. Stood out there the whole, the whole practice. I mean, it was, she might be in better shape than a couple of the players were out there. I don't pretend to be an expert on coaching, but I know enough to be on top of what's going on. TJ, well, congratulations. We're so happy that you're with us now. Well, my mother has been to every single NFL owner meeting since she became the principal owner. There's no doubt. Oh, when you go to the league meetings. She's anything but your typical 93-year-old. She's extremely energetic, extremely with it. She understands everything that's going on in the National Football League, and she's very focused uh, on her team and on the league in general. I mean, she is uh, a remarkable uh, woman. My mother is definitely a role model. Three is a winner tonight. Yeah, got to, got to. Okay. At her age that she can do this, most people can't do it even if they're 40, never mind at 93. I just hope I'm still here when I'm 93. I'm not sure about running the team. I love it. I love doing it. That's why I do it. It's not for any ulterior reason. I just love being part of it. On defense. Get him, get him. Brady rolls right. A lot of room out there. Brady comes back left. Going to get set back inside the Let's hear it. They come in against the reigning AFC champions and get a victory on Sunday night. I just want a winning team for all our fans. They deserve it. Oh, my gosh. oh what a great Is that better? win. Oh, yeah, a great win. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, congratulations to you. I'm working on it day and night. That was so, great all wow. around. Great. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, Still my heart. <laughs> That's how they are. That's how the big ones are. They're yeah. you know, oh gonna hang in there. So so. Great. My best memory hasn't come yet. I wanna I wanna get the Lombardi trophy. I thought it was wonderful that the Eagles won this year, not slighting anyone, but we were a part of them at one time. We were called the Steagles. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt, wow, we're in on this. You have enough trophies, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But there's always room for one more. <laughs>
After decades of subpar seasons, the Steelers dominated the 70s, winning four Super Bowls. It was a marvelous kind of feeling to be part of a, a Super Bowl. The Pittsburgh Steelers are the champions of the National Football League for the fourth time. We were struggling here in Pittsburgh because our steel industry was leaving and lots of loss of jobs and people who had spent their livelihood there and generations. I think that sparked um, some kind of a we're in this together feeling between the people and the team itself. And they sort of adopted and merged their identities. Received our first communion here and then confirmation. We were married here and uh, Jim was married here. My daughter was married here. Have there been a few prayers for the Steelers said in this? Building? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they've been in here. Yeah. Because of the closeness, we'll get pirate shirts, Steeler shirts, like sports shirts. People will come to church. Yeah. Oh, in their jerseys. In their jerseys, oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I think we broke the code on dressing up. <laughs> After raising nine children, Patricia Rooney adopted a new identity of her own. She earned a master's degree and became a professor of communications at Robert Morris University. Someone must have snitched in the school because they were very, you know, good, good students. And the one raised his hand and he said, is it true you're from the Pittsburgh Steelers? I said, oh, that's my husband. That's not me. About two days later, can you get us tickets to a game? Though she now had her own career, Dan Rooney always considered Patricia an essential advisor. When there were high stakes endeavors, he would rely on her a lot. All the conversations about the Rooney rule and how are they gonna get this right. In 2003, Dan Rooney helped establish the Rooney rule, which requires teams to interview at least one minority candidate for head coaching positions. It all started with Certain people got interviewed and other people didn't even get invited to be interviewed. The Rooney Rule just wants to slow down the process to make sure that people don't do what's comfortable or familiar. He saw with the Steelers of the 70s, when you did it, you had a competitive advantage. I mean, we were better than everyone else, and it was because he had this commitment to treating people fairly. I always thought we had a badass owner <laughs> that kind of was ahead of his time. It's great for sport, it's great for football, but it's also great for society because I think that's all we want for the next generation, our children, is an opportunity uh, if they're deserving of one. In 2009, the Rooney legacy expanded beyond the NFL when Dan became the U.S. ambassador to Ireland. When's the last time you've lived outside of Pittsburgh? I've never lived outside of Pittsburgh in my life. <laughs> I realize that it's a great opportunity, but I will always be a Pittsburgher. The Roonies fit like this in, into Pittsburgh. Yeah! Off we go. You live in Pittsburgh long enough, you meet a lot of Roonies. And I can honestly say, I've never met one I didn't like. The other Bob, too. <laughs> but above them all were Pat and Dan. Well, that's cute going down the steps. Yes, well, good luck. I love you and your beautiful family. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good to see Take you. Take care. Welcome to Pittsburgh. No, I'm back hey. home. I'm from this area. Are you really? I'm from Uniontown. Oh, I'm so happy to hear I that. I grew up with the Steelers. Oh, I'm good. Now, where are you from? I'm from the north side. Oh, she's from the north side. Yeah, we live on the north side. OK, Yeah. Great. They're just real people. They love the north side. They love Pittsburgh. And uh, they worked hard at making it better. Hey, Jesse. At 86, Patricia is still working to help her city prosper. We started this charity called um, Project Bundle Up. It's lasted 40 years. I probably want to go up one more size bigger than that so he can kind of grow into it. That's the one there, huh? All right, let's get you some more stuff. Project Bundle Up, that was kind of the approach that was brought to a lot of rookies. Hey, this is something Mrs. Rooney's a part of. We'd love for you to come out to the mall and get snow gloves, coats, hats. Uh, he's kind of like my Ken Barbie doll right here. You know, I'm dressing him up, accessorizing him, letting him walk down the catwalk. Show, show the people our catwalk. Walk down there right there, quick. You're here every year, every, every year. year. I, I love it. This is, this is uh, Mrs. Rooney's uh, little pride. This is her little project. I love this city. They are Pittsburgh, you know? The representatives of Pittsburgh, how they live their lives, their leaders in the community. You go to the Christmas party at the Rooney house, 
There would be Chuck Knoll and Tomlin and uh, the mayor. There was also Gus the Ice Ball Man. How long have the Roonies been coming here? Oh, forever. From <laughs> kids. They came here from kids. We've been coming to this for years. He'd say, let's walk up to Gus's. I said, we were just there last night. He said, well, let's go see him anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great. It's all family everywhere in Pittsburgh, Not right? Sure. Wherever you go in life, if you know you're no longer a stealer, the roots and the values were, were instilled by Mrs. Rooney. I want to wish everyone Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Pittsburgh has always given me so much, and so this is a way that I can give back in a special way. And I want to introduce Mrs. Rooney, uh, really, who started me on this quest of giving back. I get it now. I understand what the Pittsburgh Steelers mean to the city of Pittsburgh. It's bigger than just football, and for that, I'm always grateful for her. There she goes. Oh, man. How many Super Bowls have you been to? Five. Oh, I four. Take you. You're only three, that is really, really big good. deal. Yeah. Phoebe, how many Super Bowls have you been to? 52. I am the only woman who has seen all 52 Super Bowls, and I consider it a great privilege, and I have enjoyed every single one of them so much. Norma, we can't talk about major moments without talking about your 52 major moments, uh, all these Super Bowls you've attended. I should point out, too, in the group of seven that she's in, she's the only woman, as I mentioned, the only owner. The other six are media people. They're photographers and writers who have been going for yeah. years because it was their job to go. Um, at what point did you realize, I'm on a streak now? <laughs> uh, Lamar noticed it really early. Wow. And so when we got into the later 30s, he really started bragging. And somehow, in his own mind, he had figured out that I was the only woman. And I kept saying, honey, you don't know I'm the only woman. There was probably some fan at Super Bowl I, you know, <laughs> that you just don't know anything about. He said, almost nobody came to Super Bowl. <laughs> 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 so, uh, at any rate, and then I said, and also, would you please just say I was a child bride? You are <laughs> aging me horribly. <laughs> 38 Super Bowls? Really now? This year, Norma Hunt attended her 53rd Super Bowl. When we go to the stadium, we always take a family picture. We take one outside the stadium, and then we take one inside to prove that we actually made it to the game. And hello, everyone, and welcome to Super Bowl 53 between the New England Patriots and the Los Angeles Rams. We've been through everything to be here in this moment, in this moment. Tonight is the night. How fabulous is you see the video board up Oh my Years before Norma's first of 53 Super Bowls, Lamar Hunt put her fandom to the test. When my parents were dating, it was important for my dad to make sure that my mother was really the, the sports fan that she seemed to be. And so on one weekend in the fall, uh, they attended five football games, which my dad later referred to as the football header. I'm absolutely convinced that was designed to see if I was the right girl for him. And if I had flunked, I was going to be totally out. The football header included a high school football game Friday night. On Saturday afternoon, SMU game drove to Waco, Texas to see Baylor. On Sunday, we came up to see the Chiefs. And on Monday night, it was Grambling and Prairie View, and it was just a Fabulous, but anyway, so we made it to five. <laughs> oh my God. 
Yeah. He just felt like that was pretty much normal life. If you could possibly do that, you would do it any time you possibly could. So I think he gave up and said, well, I'm going to have to marry her. My dad was a fan of all sports, and the great thing, my mom was too. And so when he decided, hey, you know, we're going to fly to New York and go to the Ollie Frazier fight, she was like, great, let's do it. My mom is the ultimate sports fan, and because it doesn't matter what sport it is, she likes watching it. There's no sporting event that she loves better uh, than the Super Bowl. I saw the first 40 with Lamar, and uh, we just had the best time. Well, let's take a look at these. Super Bowl one. not a lot of people can say they've been to that. You can. The league is going just a little ways, right? And she enjoys the whole weekend, the parties. You know your rookie card is the most expensive football card, right? So $350,000. Really? Not bad. Uh, she loves every last bit of it. Come to Kansas City. We will. We're, we're yes. really fun to watch. I know. I know. I know. Well, and especially with Patrick. You Pat betcha. Yeah. Is something else. Lamar predicted that this game would become the most important sporting event in America. Wow. To be able to see this event every year is just a gift. These are my favorite special effects. When Lamar became ill in 2007, he worried that Norma's Super Bowl streak might be in jeopardy. Well, he was in the hospital bed, and he just wanted to talk to me and my brother about a couple things. And he said, he started off with, I need you to keep your mom's Super Bowl streak going. You promise me you'll take her. Don't let her quit. And he passed away in December, and at that time, the Super Bowl was in January, and he was very afraid that I would be too sad to go to the Super Bowl. Tonight's honorary captains are Mrs. Norma Hunt, the wife of the late football visionary Lamar Hunt. But because he told them that he wanted me to keep going, I have kept going. And so I hope I'm able to keep going the rest of the way. He cared so much about the game and cared so much about her and knew how important it was to her. My mom loves keeping her streak alive because it is honoring dad and what he came up with at the Super Bowl, and she had a hand in it. What I'm calling our little club, this is the truth. I always say it's actually the Fab Three and Norma. <laughs> No. I don't deserve to be in no, your company, you but it's been too. such a pleasure. <laughs> but you're it's the so one much. who has been to all, all of the Super Bowl games. McCaskey, Ford, Rooney, and Hunt. Their names are synonymous with the NFL and will forever hold a special place in the league's first 100 years. The best part about owning the team is winning. And to me, that's everything. We need this win tonight. We need this win tonight for sure, yeah. When we win, it's about everybody. The team, the fans, our family. The athleticism of the players truly just blows me away. Look at the magic of the quarterback. Throws it like almost a no look. That you will not see again anywhere this year, I promise you. They're thrilling for me, but also for thousands and thousands of fans across the United States. It's an honor to take a team and have them represent your city. It's almost like a gift. Are you a Pittsburgher? There'll always be a Rooney in Pittsburgh football. People ask me, how many games do you think you've attended? I have no idea. I couldn't begin to give you a figure. It is a different way of life, and it is a very exciting way of life. I can't think of a better life. We're all very blessed.